This is Janice Hamlin. I'm Executive Vice President of Barney Consulting, and you are watching Eye on Business. Everybody, this is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report for Ion Business. Each time we talk, I have a chance to give you insights into how to manage your business, perhaps how to make marketing better, how to manage your employees, or sometimes, like today, we're going to talk about how to manage your mantra. A mantra is a very short sentence that says who you are and what you do. And people will remember you for your mantra far longer than they'll remember you for anything else. And so if you don't mind today, I'm going to delve, develop, or delve into my own story by telling my own mantra. So tell me a story, because I have a short attention span. And so that's what we're going to do today. In fact, today we're going to talk about my own story. Here's a story of my life that starts from the beginning that kind of describes who I am and gives you a chance to say, in your terms, how you are as well. So 57 years ago, 1958, Whoa. I started my first business at the age of 16 in the bedroom of my home. In fact, here I am at that 16 age building a recording studio that became a record company that became a public company in Hollywood. So how did all that happen and how did that lead to where I got into the computer business? It's an interesting story and I'll tell it very fast. So from that little tiny studio that I put together from parts that I cobbled together from many places, I was able to work my way through college, here I am as a sophomore in college, with the company car, operating the business every day of the week as I ran my way through college. And at the end of my college time, I was making about $300,000 in gross with 52 independent contractors and no employees, farming out the entire source of supply. That meant that I, at that time, was giving away a great piece of the gross profit to other people. As soon as I graduated from college, the very first thing I did was to build my company for real. And it didn't take three years to have enough money to begin to build a building, which we did, hire my first real employee rather than independent contractors, and get down to the business of vertically integrating, a term that we use to say buying and building the sources of supply. So I did just that taking the company to Hollywood within another three years, outgrowing that office building. And in fact, in Hollywood, we built the West Coast and perhaps the industry's only complete facility in one building. You could walk in the door, record in the studio if you chose, bring us your tape if you didn't, and a week later walk out from the same building with no other materials coming into the building but vinyl pellets and uh, vinyl materials and have a finished phonograph record album at the time. It was amazing. I loved the business. It was the technology of the day because computers hadn't yet been invented. Well, not quite, because in 1971, I bought the very first MAI Basic 4 computer, serial number 4, and programmed it myself. I had such fun doing that that I built programs for manufacturing resource control, as well as accounts receivable, accounts payable, payroll, all those programs. And the salespeople for the hardware company began to see that I was the only early user of their mini computer that had made a successful program that worked. And they began bringing people in and letting me give demonstrations to them. It didn't take long at all before I realized that there was more money in these programs that I had written for my own company than in the company itself. So by that time, I'd taken the company public, I sold the company, sold my interest in the company, and went into the computer programming business, settling on programming for hotels. And at that time, programming for hotels, we were there as the second or third entrant into an industry that had no automation at the time, giving us a chance to build 16% of the entire automated hotels of the world, as well as 22% of the automated hotels in the United States. I love to tell the story that even today, 
22 years later, or is it even more than that, Marriott Corporation still uses 3,500 of those systems that I wrote in 1971 through 1981, and uh, they leased in, in 1981. It's a wonderful story of how some of these old programs still happen. The company was an Inc. 500 company, twice, and did well for all of us, and I sold the company in 1990. In fact, there's a story there. I sold the company when I realized when all of my company, my employees celebrated the 50th birthday, my 50th birthday, by wearing black, that maybe perhaps it was time for me to move on. An unintended consequence, I'm certain, for them, at the same time as it gave a real opportunity for me to rethink the third phase of my life. And that was hearing the angel's call, or deciding that I wanted to be an angel investor. However, back in those days, 1993, the term angel investor hadn't yet been invented. And so you see in the background the book that I wrote in 1993 called Better Than Money that tried to describe what I called resource capitalism that later became angel investing. And on the right side of the screen, you see Inc. Magazine in 1996 calling me a super angel. It was the first time that the word super angel had ever been used and a very, very early time that the word angel had been used. And they just uh, thought of it in terms of a nice thing to say. And so Inc. Magazine might be credited for popularizing the term angel investing. Well, it was very easy from there to move on. And so, since that time, 1993, I've seen 7,000 business plans. I have invested in 137 of those companies, 86 of them second rounds. I've had 17 liquidity events, meaning positive liquidity events where I've made money, and 29 where I didn't, and 91 companies that still, to this day, continue in their business. My internal rate of return is almost 100%. It's 97% per year, like doubling a penny. And if you take away one very big one, it's 80%. And if you take away all of the angel investments, or at least you then give the money to the bank, it's down to 23%. So it says that there's been a lot of money made in angel investing, but four of those investments account for 90% of all the money I have ever made. It's a lesson for angel investors and venture capitalists. It doesn't take many. In fact, it only takes one or two to make everything happen. And so you have just heard in five minutes maybe, my story. You've heard my mantra, lessons of a lifetime in 140 characters or less, and you understand more about me. Now, five minutes was a very long time, but at least the mantra gives you an idea that Birkinomics, my tagline, my mantra as it is, is something that I hope you'll remember. At the same time as, it's time for you to think about yours. Have you done something that makes the reputation for you? Have you done something that gives other people a chance to know with just a few words who you are? It's worthwhile for you to think about that for a while, not just for yourself, but for your company as well. Is there a mantra that names your company the same way that you'd be naming yourself? It's a great exercise. It's worth doing, and I look forward to seeing some of these mantras over time and certainly hope that you develop one that people do remember and smile when they hear. This is Dave Burkus for Ion Business and the Burkus Report. Hi, my name is Jeff Dre. I'm CEO of Grolltex, and you are watching Ion Business. Welcome back to Ion Business. I am Kevin McDonald, and tonight with me is Eric Huber. Eric is a very unique individual. He is a serial inventor. He's a serial, sometimes entrepreneur, and he's decided to give us some of his time tonight. Thank you so much for Great. coming in, Thank Eric. Thank you for having me, How Kevin. How are you? Good. Thank so, you. Um, we, serial inventor, just really quickly for those that are not in the industry, what does that mean? That just means somebody who isn't real focused and has a lot of ideas. And so I have, over the time, um, I've, I don't know how many, 100 to 200 different ideas that I have prototyped and mm -hmm. trying to commercialize. So. so do you call a classic as an inventor somebody who actually takes the effort to try to move forward with an idea rather than someone who walks around with them in their head? Absolutely. And that's the difference between an idea and an invention. An idea is just something basically in your head, on your, in your notebook, on the mm -hmm. back of a napkin. But the invention is taking that and putting it into practice. And so that's the next step. Well, it's exciting to see some of the things you have going on. I understand you've got some wearable security devices, some miniaturized furniture, uh, awesome lemon products for, for cleanliness and making things pretty and shiny. But I also understand you work with the Moore Foundation. So let's start yeah. with a few of your inventions, and then we'll move into that. Uh, tell me about some of your most exciting things that you have going right now. Well, right that now. That you can share, by the way. Yes, well, and I can only share so much. That's right. Um, one of those, as you mentioned, the personal uh, self-defense. It's a company we've started called Defendables. 
So um, that's that's probably my right now my number one focus product wise. Okay. The next one um, with the furniture line, it's called Snap Furniture, and where that came from is my daughter was tending to move a lot, and I used to have a truck, and it wasn't too big a deal to move her, um, but then I got a Prius and it became difficult to move her from apartment to apartment. So I came up with a line of furniture that basically you can fit an entire apartment, 13 pieces, into the back of a Prius in one trip. Wow. And it doesn't take any tools, there's no instructions, it's very simple, but it's very comfortable and durable. So, so. all you tiny house buyers, are you paying attention? That's so, right, so that's, that's right. That looks interesting. So tell me a little bit about your lemon product. So that's called Lemonology, okay. and that's basically taking whole lemons and doing things with them, from cleaning, to um, uh, freshening the house, to uh, beautifying, um, you know, uh, cosmetic type things. So, but the, the premise is just basically using a whole lemon and not, nothing else. And so that's actually starting to get some legs now too. And that's been a fun one to work on, a lot of fun. Interesting. So a lot of people f have some, what I would consider to be really unique and exciting ideas, but um, never either take the leap or, or don't understand how to do that. So one of the things we like to do here is remove some of the mythology behind mm -hmm. how things work. So. Can you give us a little bit of an idea of if someone has a really awesome idea that they're 100% behind, where do they start? Well, the, the biggest thing is it's very hard to come up with an original idea. Um, even most inventions nowadays are pieces from different things. So my suggestion is always look at the marketplace. See if there's anything out there. Do patent searches. See if there's anything written about something similar to your product. Mm -hmm. I often, what I do, uh, have my son, I'll give him money if he can find this product because I want it found. I want it found as soon as possible so I can take that off my list and move on. Before you waste any investment. By the way, Absolutely. the Patent and Trademark Office in the U.S. government online allows you to do pretty good searches and Absolutely. if you learn to get good at it, you can actually find a lot of these things. It's amazing what people have already invented that you may or may not know. So oh, absolutely. From that perspective, let's say once you do decide, okay, I've got this idea. I think it's potentially not been invented by someone else. Mm -hmm. Prior art is what that's called when someone else has already invented right. it. Um, now what? Now it, it, you need to look at yourself. You need to look at your skill set. You need to see who you have in your network, who's around you, who can help you. You can't do everything yourself. And there are so many pieces to um, bringing a product to the market. And it's a long process, an expensive process. And it, to, honestly, it's, it's a shot in the dark. So it's something that you really need to look at yourself. Are you willing to do that? My, I prefer a, a route of going to the licensing, looking okay. for licensees. And that is, I find that a better way to go because these people have already established themselves. They have the distribution channels. They have the know-how. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to build that. And it's very difficult to go to a market with a single product. So you take the product, get your patent or patent pending, and then start looking for people that are willing to pay money to either use it or distribute it. Correct. Effectively yeah. is yeah. what licensing means. Right? Absolutely. So from the perspective, it sounds like you're involved in trying to uh, encourage other folks, this uh, group called the Moore Foundation mm -hmm. yeah. that you're a part of. So why don't you give me a little bit of an idea what that's about? Well, Moore Foundation is a, um, it's a nonprofit that we started not too long ago that goes into universities and teams university students along with mentors you, um, use, utilizing existing intellectual property, existing patents. They compete on that patent, and then at the end, the winning team is provided with startup funds, um, mentoring, maybe put into an accelerator, and to try to increase their odds in, in having a successful startup. That's pretty exciting. Yeah. How long have you been doing that? We have been, well, probably about a year now. Okay. And we're about to have our first event with a local university. Okay. And it's really exciting. We're a little different in the, from other startup competitions because we are actually taking existing intellectual property. So it is truly an apples to apples. It's here's the patent. You guys form your team and compete on this patent. So it's a little bit different approach, but I think we have um, built a, a way to ensure success a little bit more, have more success. Well, than Tina, to me that's much more exciting because it really does, it, it gives you that leg up in the opportunity mm -hmm. to go chase that patent. Right. And for a group to learn from that side, although the patent process is something people should learn, mm -hmm. it's really a technical process right. and a legal process. It's not... It's not what makes you rich. Getting a patent is not what makes Absolutely you rich. No. It's taking that and making people buy the patent, um, whether it's consumers or licensees or whoever it might be. Yeah, because so. remember, about 95% uh, of patents are not commercialized. Right. So there's only, actually, it's about 2 to 5% of patents actually are on the market. So, so before you go sell your house and your kids' funds for college, 
five percent. That's it. Yeah. Not to say you shouldn't do it, but five percent is not a lot. Right. Um, so. Do me a favor, and I understand you were just elected to a major uh, inventors association. Why don't you yes. tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, that's really exciting. So I was uh, in, elected to the board of directors of the United Inventors Association of America, mm -hmm. and it's a it's an organization that's been around for many, many, many years, based out of Washington D.C. There's a lot of notable people on there, and me now, mm -hmm. um, which is really Makes exciting. You to, yes, I've kind of found a little um, place for me, and that is that I am a true independent inventor. I am a garage inventor. I have a man cave in the backyard that I make products. And so there's, I think that gets lost. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, service providers. There's a lot of people um, who have started companies that are involved in these. Mm -hmm. But there's not the true independent inventor. And I'm the person who is their audience. So my voice, I think, is actually starting to, starting to be helpful for some of these organizations. That's I'm really, really great. Do you, do you share that um, passion and, and that view of the world with this, the, the entrepreneurs that you're teaching or, or mentoring in this other program? That yes, ab Foundation. absolutely. And they've seen your, your man cave? No. No. This is that pretty, a secret man cave? Pretty private, yeah. Pretty yeah. private, okay. Yeah. No. Um, there, there's pictures online. He'll kill it. you if you actually That's see right. it. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so, yes, absolutely. And it's, it's fun because a lot of people, everybody has ideas. And so I'm finding that's a fun thing to talk about, too, that every single person out there, you're all inventors. It's just a matter of that idea, what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. And to give them some of my you know, personal stories and such seems to be of interest. So it's, it's a lot of fun talking to people. That's great. Well, we have viewers, of course, all over the country. And one of the things I like to do is to give folks like yourself an opportunity in about the two minutes that we have left here. Mm -hmm. If you have the ability to pass any message on to folks that are out there thinking about dreaming or struggling right now, what, w what would the message be? Well, I think it would be a message of a few. There was a few things, especially when it comes to inventing. One is to be patient. Um, that we tend to want things to happen quickly, especially in the technology-driven market that we're in now. Things happen so quick. Mm -hmm. Inventing takes a, takes a while. I mean, it's very common to take one to three years to get something from, from your idea to the marketplace. So right. be patient. Do your do due diligence. That's very important. I have um, a lot of friends who have spent literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on bringing a product to market, and there's no there's no guarantee that's going to be a success, and that's a big risk to put your family in. So I have I have licensed about ten different products, and in no case did I spend over two hundred dollars. And so you can absolutely do it without having a lot of money. Have you considered writing a book on how you do that? Because, I mean, to me, I've, I'm actually, you know, a master goldsmith myself, and mm -hmm. I have ideas sitting in a box that I believe both the mechanics and the idea work. Absolutely. But I don't have the time and effort or the energy to try to figure out how to make it work. Right. So having someone tell me the shortcuts where I don't have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to sure. do that would be pretty exciting. Um, tell me um, very quickly sure. your biggest <laughs> failure and your biggest success. I luckily haven't had a big failure in the sense of uh, monetarily. Okay. So because I am not a big risk taker, and that has kind of, I think, held me back. So that has been something, but I haven't had a major failure. My successes, there's a lot of small successes. I haven't had any huge, big, you know, big home runs. Breakouts. Right. right, but a lot of small successes. And, and honestly, I'd rather have you know, many eggs or a few eggs in many baskets than have you know, one huge success, which, again, I, no, I don't. Sounds weird. Of course, I'd take a huge success. Yeah. But once that's over, now what? Right. So I, I like this process of having many, many smaller ideas, but they just keep coming. So. Well, it sounds like you have a lot to share, so I'd like to invite you to come back and oh, great. even maybe invite myself to come see your place and bring a camera Ooh, one yeah, day. Fun, yeah. We could put some of the cool stuff away that we don't want anybody to see, but kind of give people an idea sure. of what the process looks like. Would you be open to that? Absolutely. absolutely. Fantastic. Well, thank, thank you, you so very much, much for coming, Eric. Honor. I really appreciate it. You've been watching Eric Huber. This is Ion Business. I'm Kevin McDonald, and we're out of here. Good evening. This is David Friedman for Ion Business, and I'm privileged to have Janice Hamlin today. Janice has been an executive with a variety of companies, including CPG companies like Mattel, uh, toy companies, and was in the entertainment field with ABC Disney. Um, welcome, Janice. I appreciate you coming on board. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thanks My pleasure. Me. Do me a favor. Tell me a little about yourself. How did you get into the entertainment field? Are you a natural performer? Because no. I know you had a little character <laughs> that you invented as a kid. I did definitely ah. do that. Yeah, I did do that. But I uh, started in entertainment uh, after I spent some time at Mattel Toys. 
I was head of marketing, uh, worldwide marketing. My title was director of worldwide marketing for fashion dolls. So I was considered the fashion doll lady. And then I left there after 10 years and got recruited by Warner Brothers Consumer Products. Oh, wow. They wanted somebody to start a marketing department in that division. So I did that, went on to become vice president of retail development, and then started a product development team in order to help retailers distinguish and uh, create unique opportunities with our brands like Batman and Looney Tunes and fun characters like that. How cool. I mean, that's really cool stuff. So you must have a perspective on entertainment. It's been really changing lately. We yes. have the internet. Yes. And we'll talk about some of the new things that uh, we were talking offline about. But tell me, what is your new vision for entertainment today? Well, it's, it's, it's really exciting, actually. I think it's exciting for the average person who can now become their own content producer, executive producer, and also for studios as well, because a lot of great creativity coming mm -hmm. into the studios that's being driven by the average person. Also, viewership has changed, so you've got you know, people who are 34 years old and under that have really changed the landscape of television. You know, that viewership on television for that particular demographic group has fallen by 30% within the past five years, leading all these studios running around saying, what do we do? What do we do? And so, you know, they turn their attention to the Internet and content producers right, who right. bring creativity into play. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promote you today. Okay. okay. <laughs> you are now president and CEO and I'll throw in chairman as a title. Oh, I thank for, you very much. <laughs> yeah, you, you deserve it. I mean, you've had a great history and a great run. But seriously, you're now in charge of ABC Disney. What would you do different that they're, than they're doing today? I would immediately turn my attention to the Internet and see who all the social media stars are, who has the most successful YouTube channels, who has the most views on YouTube, who's the most compelling in entertainment. I'd go out and do exactly what Variety Magazine did, and they did a research study with the millennials to find out who their favorite stars are, and believe it or not, they came from the Internet. Five of the top ten came from the Internet. So I would actually reverse engineer what they're currently doing Start with the internet stars and bring them right. back on broadcast. Now, I happen to be on the internet. I look at YouTube all the time, and I love the piano guys, and I love Alex Boyer. In fact, he was on America's Got Talent or something right, like that. Right. And uh, which star would you like to meet? I would like to to meet the two guys from um, from Smush because I think from they're Smush? yeah they're they're hilarious. I think they're really funny. I'd like to meet them. Um, I would like to interview Grumpy Cat. Who's Grumpy? I mean, I hate to say it, but okay, who's Grumpy well, Grumpy Cat? Cat is this character that became a star. Um, from Pinterest and Instagram. And it's basically just a grumpy cat. And now Grumpy Cat generates about half a billion dollars in licensing revenues. So I'd like to just see what's going on with Grumpy Cat. Oh, how cool. Now, we have several different screens we look at. So I'm, I'm at home, I have my big screen, I have mm -hmm. my little computer, I have my iPad, and I have my iPhone. I may have a couple of other devices sitting around the house. How do you integrate all that from a content provider? What would you do now you're, you're still in charge of mm -hmm. ABC Disney? Okay, what right. would you do to make sure all those pieces play together? Is there something magical that you can do or content-wise? Well, there's no magic about it, it, but it is about merging two different ever-changing things that are happening right now. One is the platform that you're viewing on, like you're talking about all, all those right. different devices, and the other is the technology, the actual production of those pieces that you're viewing it on. And not all program rela actually translates from a television screen into your little mobile device. That's true. So, you know, you have to look at that from a creative point of view. What can I do to make it just as good on the mobile device, just as engaging of an experience as when I'm sitting in my living room and watching it on my 52-inch ultra-high definition television. Yeah, I don't have a wall that's large. So I'm still <laughs> under a 42-inch, but that's fairly large for me. But let's talk about technology because you raised the subject. Now you have new technologies coming in, and we're seeing uh, people or companies like Oculus. We're seeing yes. a lot of virtual reality companies coming to the Tech Coast Angels and the Angel community uh, requesting funding. How do you see virtual reality coming into play either on the big screen or on the big screen small screen? Well, virtual reality will become the new platform. 
uh, as we see more um, finesse and more elegance brought to that software and how it's actually produced, we'll see a more adaptability to that as a technology. Right now, it's very sexy. It's very new. We're enamored with it. Right. I have tested that with at ABC to see does it enhance engagement, and it's actually distracting to the storyline. So you've got producers and writers that don't necessarily want it on their shows because it's distracting. It takes the viewer's mind away. But on news platforms, very compelling to put it in that place and be the first one to do it. All right. So I'm going to give you a little curveball here. Now, you raise the issue of experience, and I believe in experiential learning. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about and if you haven't, I'm asking you to think about <laughs> um, education integrated with content and virtual reality to change the educational experience of the kids today so they can literally participate in education. They're not just a viewer, they're a participant. How does that play? And is there something that maybe the major TV producers or cable producers can get involved in to change our learning experiences? If there were an incentive, I think that's a very good um, question that you're asking, uh, but it is about a money game. So if there were incentive in play to encourage major studios to start looking in that direction, it would make a huge difference because that's going to be secondary to what they do, and that's make money for their shareholders. So if there was some way to activate that, I think it would be it would actually have the educational system catch up to the student because the students actually right now are beyond where the educational system is today. They are already connected. Now, say more about that. So the students are not connected as well. Well, I'm saying just the opposite. The students are better connected than the education system. Uh, okay, when I was talking about connectivity, I wasn't thinking about the physical connectivity. I was thinking connected to learning. So how do you get students to learn more? using technology, using content, using entertainment? Well, it's, it's, um, that's a really big question. Um, I do not have a high of an IQ as Walter O'Brien does, but I will attempt to answer that question. And that's, that's the, um, I think that's sort of like a group think answer. I mean, I, I, it's a compelling question. It's actually, I'm probably going to be thinking about that after I leave the show. Um, well, you may be invited back, and we can have we a discussion can talk about only it. on that one. That, we can talk about that. I, I, I have seen some great things happening in classrooms. Unfortunately, it's happening in, in about 1%, 2% of the classrooms, not in 90% of the classroom, where it's the, there's, there's the connection between the physical, physical experience of being in the classroom and being connected with some of the greatest minds, which is not happening in most classrooms, but could be. Right. You know, and there could be a, 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 a real-time engagement with some of those greatest minds where, you, you know, kids are curious, they want to ask those questions, and they can get those answers from, you know, some of the greatest minds in the world. So for what, the last question I want to ask you is, I'm going to give you a platform. You're going to get on the platform. This is going to be your plank. What would you want to tell the viewing audience about the next generation of entertainment? What are the lessons they should learn, or what should they be looking out for? Well, I think um, there's a lot of changes coming down the um, pathway. Um, you want to be streaming your content. You want to make sure that it serves you. You want to make sure that it's sitting on the other side of the table. For years, we've delivered content the way studios have wanted to deliver it. That has now changed. Really, the control is in the hands of the viewer. And if you're not getting that experience from content deliverers, then you make the change. You have the ability to make the change. You have the control. So I think that's really great. Uh, Janice, it's been a pleasure to have you on. You. I'd love to have you again and talk about some of the other issues relating to content and education and just in general. You, you've been gracious, and I appreciate you taking time out of your busy day. This is David Friedman for Ion Business. You all have a good night.